our final lesson for chapter 5, uh, chapter 5, section 3, from protest to revolution. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking, actually, we're going to look at a lot of things. It's going to cover a lot of ground, but it can all be summed up with our essential question right here. How did the colonies go from a tea party to a revolution? So, as you can see, we're going to be talking about the Boston Tea Party and the events leading up to the beginning of the American War for Independence. So, some of the things that we'll be talking about today, I want you to first uh, take out a notebook and jot these down. Uh, if you have to, you can press pause on the video right now. Okay, you back? All right. So, some of the things to keep in mind as we're doing our discussion today, the Boston Tea Party, uh, Parliament's response to the Boston Tea Party. Um, the, uh, I want you to know about the intolerable acts, what they were, so keep these things in mind. Um, also, we're going to talk about the Quebec Act and it, why it angered the, the American colonists. And then the significance of the towns of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. So. These are five things that I want you to kind of keep in mind as we go through today's discussion. So as we go through, I want to now look at our key terms for today. So we have, we'll be talking about the Tea Act, like I said, the Boston Tea Party, along with the Intolerable Acts and the Quebec Act. We'll also talk about the First Continental Congress, a militia, and specifically Minuteman, which is a uh, part of the original colonial militia. And then we will end today talking about the battles of... So as I mentioned, today we're going to be discussing how a protest over tea eventually led to a six-year war for American independence. Um, up until this point, we've been talking about how the colonists were getting more and more fed up with the British government and they were calling for no taxation without rep representation. Well, ultimately that phrase, no taxation without representation, would result in a shot heard around the world. So our very first video is going to give you give a little clue about the rest of our lesson for today. The British are coming! The British are coming! <laughs> Now the ride of Paul Revere set the nation on its ear And the shot at Lexington heard round the world When the British fired in the early dawn The war of independence had begun The die was cast, the rebel flag unfurled And on to Concord marched the foe To seize the arsenal, there you know Waking folks, searching all around Till our militia stopped them in their tracks At the old North Bridge we turned them back And chased those red coats back to Boston town And the shot heard around the world Was the start of the revolution The minute men were ready on the move Take your powder, take your gun Report to General Washington Hurry men, there's not an hour to lose Now at famous Bunker Hill even though we lost, it was quite a thrill. The rebel Colonel Prescott proved it was wise. Outnumbered and low on ammunition, as the British stormed his position, he said, hold your fire till you see the whites of their eyes. Though the next few years were rough, General Washington's men proved they were tough. Those hungry, ragged boys would not be beat. One night they crossed the Delaware, surprised the Hessians in their lair, and at Valley Force they just bundled up their feet. Now the shot heard round the world was the start of the revolution. The minute men were ready on the move. Take your blanket, take your son, report to General Washington. We've got our rights and now it's time to prove. They showed such determination that they won the admiration of countries across the sea like France and Spain. Who loaned the colony ships and guns and put the British on the run and the Continental Army on its feet again? 
know they lost some battles Why too. The Americans now? swore they'd see it through. Their raiding parties shut up, hit and run. At Yorktown, the British could not retreat. Bottled up by Washington and the French fleet. Cornwallis surrendered, and finally we had won. When I Hooray! 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 Hooray!
to boycott British tea. In November 1773, the ship Dartmouth slipped into Boston Harbor carrying 114 cases of tea. Oddly enough, the tea in Dartmouth's hold must have been very appealing to many Bostonians because even with the tax paid, it was actually cheaper than the smuggled tea that most of them were drinking. Bad news for smugglers then, and bad news for radicals too. If people bought the tea and paid the tax, their revolutionary cause would be under threat. This is the Old South Meeting House, home to freedom of speech in America. On the 16th of December, 1773, Perhaps 5,000 people, a third of Boston's population, thronged here to listen to the arguments about what to do about the tea. And today, Bostonians are still reenacting the event. Hey. Taxation without representation is tyranny. Yes. Men like Mr. Revere and Mr. Adams are out in the streets destroying men's businesses and men's families. That is shameful. Soldiers cannot be posted among us, and yet they are. On that day in 1773, Sam Adams gave one of the most important speeches of his life. If we are prevailed upon to implicitly acknowledge a right to tax us, we may be very sure that soon, very soon, every article being exported from Great Britain will be taxed as well. And once they have Adams was playing skillfully on fears of future taxation even though the British weren't actually planning any. In any case, the whole taxation issue had never just been about making money for Britain. The colonies paid relatively little to the growing cost of their own defense. Now, brethren, we are reduced to this dilemma, to sit down quiet under this and any other burden that our enemies would impose upon us good-natured slaves, or rise and resist this tyranny. He'd fanned a storm in a teacup into a revolutionary hurricane. This was only the beginning of what was to become known as the Boston Tea Party. Fifty men dressed as Mohawk Indians, Paul Revere amongst them, went down to the wharf, boarded the Dartmouth, one of the tea ships, and threw the tea into the harbour. It was the most effective piece of non-violent protest in the whole of the 18th century. A brilliant two fingers, or if you were a rebel, a single finger, to the crown. And it had precisely the desired effect. So, Boston Tea Party, 342 chests worth of tea are dumped in a Boston harbour. The colonists, some of them are cheering, some of them are saying, that was really selfish. What about the British government? Well, Great Britain responded to the Boston Tea Party by passing what the colonists referred to as the Intolerable Acts. And the Intolerable Acts were a set of very harsh laws that were meant to punish the colonists for these protests. And the goal of the acts was actually to punish Massachusetts specifically because of the unruly behavior of the people of Boston. So these acts were, were passed to punish, uh, to punish Massachusetts, but all of the colonies ended up kind of feeling the, feeling the effects of them. So let's go into a little bit more detail about the Intolerable Acts. Now, the Intolerable Acts can kind of be... Uh, here, I'll scroll down a little bit so that we can see what we got. Now, the intolerable acts can be grouped into, basically into four categories. So the first of the acts shut down the port of Boston completely. And that was because Boston is where the main protests had taken place, obviously. So the harbor of Boston was, remain, was to stay closed until the colonists paid for all of the tea that they had destroyed. So it's kind of like if you're a... Uh, um, if you're if you're playing and and some, something breaks, your mom takes away the toys that you're not allowed to use this until you can pay for the lamp that you broke. 
kind of a similar idea for that. So first the Axe shut down the port of Boston completely until the colonists paid for all of the tea. The second one forbade the colonists of Massachusetts from holding town meetings more than once a year. Now, why is this important? Well, prior to this, the colonists could call town meetings whenever they wanted. Um, so this was, they saw this as a huge, uh, they were the, a lot of their rights as citizens were being taken away. So instead of being able to call town meetings and convene whenever they wanted, they could only do so once a year, and all of the juries would now be selected by the king's officials. So instead of being a jury of peers, it would be hand-selected by the king's officials. So that was the second act. The third one allowed customs agents charged with crimes in the colonies to be tried in Great Britain. Now why would this why would this matter? Well, this one specifically angered colonists because they felt that if there were any dishonest officials that were charged with a crime in the colonies, they might be able to avoid punishment by getting a sympathetic jury across the sea. And also, since they had to go back to Great Britain, there would be a larger time span between the crime and the, the potential punishment. So this made a lot of colonists think like, all right, well, now these customs agents are going to be able to get away with whatever they want because they have to be tried in Great Britain. And the fourth act was an update of a previous law called the Quartering Act. And this update to the Quartering Act required all, all colonists to house British soldiers in their homes when no other housing was available. So the Port of Boston was shut down completely until the colonists would pay for all the tea. Second act, uh, ma colonists in Massachusetts were no longer allowed to hold town meetings any more than once a year. Uh, third act, customs agents would be tried for any crimes committed in the colonies in Great Britain. And the fourth was an update of the quartering act. The government quickly passed laws intended to punish the Massachusetts Bay Colony and to force its citizens into obedience. In America, these laws came to be known as the Intolerable Acts because they made living in Massachusetts extremely difficult. As a result of the Intolerable Acts, extra troops were sent to the colony to maintain order. Boston's harbor was shut down. Trade suffered badly. And the Massachusetts legislature was suspended, disrupting the colony's government. Immediately, committees of correspondence sent off letters. They warned of what might happen if Britain suspended other colonial legislatures and suggested that representatives from every colony meet to find ways of resisting the intolerable acts. So, so along with these intolerable acts, around this same time, Parliament passed what is known as the Quebec Act, and the Quebec Act set up a government for Canada and gave Quebec complete religious freedom. Well, and that's a good thing, right? But it also extended the borders of Quebec, which pleased French Canadians, but angered a lot of American colonists, mainly because they eventually wanted to move into that area. So as you can see from the map, the province from, of Quebec now includes parts of what is now uh, upstate New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan. So areas that are, are now states, at this time they were split, they, were, they belonged to Great Britain. So French Canadians now had access to all of this land and uh, American colonists were like, wait, we wanted to go into that land too. So that was just, that was just one more thing that kind of like upset the American colonists. It was, it was like, a, like a, hey, what's... So, so the Intolerable Acts were a response to the Boston Tea Party and to protests in New England by Great Britain. Now it was time for the colonists to respond. So in response to the Intolerable Acts, colonial leaders formed the first Continental Congress and 
the Congress passed a resolution to send aid to the people of Massachusetts and also urged the colonies to unite and begin to organize militias. And a militia is an army of citizens who serve as soldiers in in the fall of 1774, representatives from all the colonies except Georgia met in Philadelphia. Their historic meeting was called the First Continental Congress and was attended by George Washington of Virginia. After a little over two weeks of debate, the Continental Congress hoping to put economic pressure on Britain, requested the colonists to stop sending them exports until a new way of preserving American liberties could be found. At this time, the colonies weren't actually seeking independence. They just wanted their old rights back. Nevertheless, the actions of the Continental Congress were unmistakably those of a real government. As a matter of fact, Congress even advised that the colonies should start preparing their citizens for the possibility of war. Lexington and Concord. So, all of this stuff is going on between 1770 and 1775. There's uh, boycotts and responses from England and retaliations by the colonists back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So, which brings us to early in 1775. Um, a group of British soldiers marched from Boston out to try and capture weapons that uh, the colonial militia had been collecting in Concord. And Concord is a village about 18 miles outside of Boston. On April 18th, about 700 British troops left Boston in order to try and seize the militia's arms. And as they left, two lamps were hung from the old North, North Church. Remember that old, one if by land, two if by sea? To signal that to the colonists that the soldiers were coming across the Charles River. So these two lamps signal colonial riders, including but not limited to Paul Revere, to deliver the message to the Minutemen, and the Minutemen were, was the nickname for the colonial militia because they were prepared to fight at a minute's notice. So, daybreak of the 19th, the British soldiers, the Redcoats, reached Lexington, Massachusetts, which is near Concord, and were met by 70 Minutemen. The colonists were severely outnumbered, and after being advanced upon by the Redcoats, they began to withdraw. And no one actually knows who fired the first shot, but at this point it doesn't really matter who did, because once that first shot was fired, it started back and forth, back and forth, and when all, when all was said and done, eight colonists had been killed, and that shot became known as the shot heard round the world. So. The Redcoats, they meet, uh, they meet the Minutemen in Lexington. They fire upon, there's shots on both sides. Eight colonists are dead. The Minutemen withdraw. The British push on towards Concord, where they ended up finding no arms because they had already been removed by the Minutemen there. And this time they were met by 300 colonial militia on a bridge outside Concord. And this time, it was the British who were forced to retreat. Uh, colonial sharps, sharpshooters took up positions and took aim and killed 73 redcoats. And another 200 were either wounded or went missing during the small battle. And it was this series of events that turned out to be the start of a six-year struggle that would ultimately result in the formation of a new independent nation out of these 13 British colonies. By dawn, 900 British troops under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith were reaching the outskirts of Lexington. In the grey light, Lieutenant Sutherland of the advance guard 
could see a vast number of militia with their arms going over the hill towards Lexington. His comrade, Jeremy Lister, at the 10th foot, could see beacon fires burning brightly on the surrounding hills. Imagine the effect on the Redcoats of the sight of the warning beacons and the sound of the alarm church bells and musket shots. Although these men were tough regular soldiers, few of them were battle hardened. Paul Revere had already been captured by an advance party of British officers and then released. But again, he'd done his work well. He'd told them what to expect, and rumour was passing back along the column. Paranoia was beginning to take hold. On this green, Captain John Parker, the elected commander of the Lexington militia, had mustered his men. Seeing the approaching superior numbers, Captain Parker ordered, let the troops pass by. Don't molest them without they being first. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they want a war, let it begin here. The lieutenant leading the British advance guard decided to march straight towards the militia rather than bypass them along the road. His commander, Major John Pitt Cairn, riding up from the rear, was dismayed by this confrontational tactic. Halt! Halt! He tried to stop the troops and warn off the rebels. Stand where you are! Rebels, disperse and throw down your arms! Halt the column! Halt! Captain Parker ordered his men to disperse and not to fire, and they began to retreat. No one knows who actually fired the first shot. That moment, when flint struck steel, and the spark flashed into the black powder, was decisive. Sent your firelocks. There could be no going back. Fire! One kneeling militiaman, Jonas Parker, was bayoneted as he tried to reload. Jonathan Harrington was shot in the back and died just there, on his doorstep, in front of his wife. Only the arrival of Colonel Smith and the rear guard put an end to the bloodletting. Eight militiamen were dead. Sam Adams, with John Hancock, had only just left Lexington and was still in earshot. This bloodshed was exactly what he had been working for. Who actually fired this shot heard round the world? It's impossible to be sure. And in any case, it doesn't really matter, because by now conflict was inevitable. This wasn't the first blow of the American Revolution. That had already been struck with the takeover of civil authorities across the whole of Massachusetts. This was the first shot of the Civil War. That bloodletting that Thomas Gage had feared had now begun. The British pressed on to Concord, still unaware of the size and determination of the irregular force assembled against them. From up to 50 miles around, Paul Revere and his chain of riders had mobilized thousands of militiamen, spoiling for exactly this sort of fight. When Colonel Smith arrived at Concord, he found that most of the arms had already been moved. A small detachment was sent over this, the town's north ridge, 
to secure the weapons from Barrett's farm. About a hundred soldiers were left to guard the bridge itself. Although there were already hundreds of militia on the far side, they took no action until they saw smoke and flames coming from the town. The thought of their homes being torched by the redcoats enraged the militiamen, and the cry went up, would you let them burn the town down? Then something remarkable happened. This supposed rabble formed into rough lines and opened a well-aimed fire, killing three soldiers. Many of these rebels had served with the British against the French in the Seven Years' War, just 12 years before. About 200 militia charged over the bridge and headed for the town, following the retreating redcoats. Shortly afterwards, the British force reappeared that had been sent to Barrett's farm. As it crossed the bridge, it found a dying British soldier. According to redcoat accounts, he'd been scalped and had his ears and brain removed. It was the first atrocity story of the war. This is a war between brothers, between cousins. That's what gives events in a place like this their strange and terrible edge. These are battles between people who could so easily have been friends and often were friends. Which brings us to our assignment for today. Now, for today's assignment, I want you to read the excerpt from Johnny Tremaine on pages 164 and 165 in your textbook. Now, if you don't have a textbook or if it's not with you for some reason, if you highlight, if you click on the, these numbers 164 and 165, you can download those pages. So after you have read that section, I want you to create a dialogue between Johnny and Rab as if they were talking to each other during the evening of June 1st, 1774. So the events on page 164 and 165 take place during the day. So you're, you're to uh, take all those things and imagine how, what they would be saying to each other that evening, kind of recounting. And I want you to include what their, their feelings about the day's events, as well as the facts that were listed within the pages. And there are a couple of different options on how to uh, how to complete and how to upload this assignment. Right. Option one, uh, you can write out your dialogue on a, on a piece of paper or do it as a Word document, LibreOffice, um, and type it out as if it's you're scripting it. That's that's one way to do it. I'm fine with I'm fine with that. Just make sure that it's saved as a .doc, .odt, or in rich text format, especially if you're doing it on a Mac. That, that'll make your life a little bit easier. And make sure you check your grammar and spelling before submitting. So that's option one. Option two, uh, you can, option two is to create a short comic, comic strip of at least three frames. I'm looking for like three to six in which Johnny and Rab discuss the events of the day. You can do this by hand, do this uh, in paint, um, whatever you choose. You can, But you need to include the same information as if you were creating the dialogue and scripting it all out. But this option allows some of you who are uh, a little bit more art artistically talented. I'm not one of those. So, But those of you, if you are artistically talented, this allows you to use some of those art skills that you've been practicing. Um, which I know that many, many of you do possess. Um, and an option with that, you can, if, you, if you don't do it by hand, I do have a limited number of licenses for Powtoon.com, which you can use to create a comic strip. So if you want to use that for your cartoon, please let me know, and I'll try to give you access. But like I said, I only have a very limited number of licenses, so it's going to kind of be first come, first serve for that. I'm sorry. Um, and this assignment will be worth 20 points, and I will take off points for spelling and grammar, but the main meat of what you'll be graded on is the information that you provide, and if that information is historically accurate, or if it's, if it's plausible. 
all right? But if you have any questions, please contact me before the assignment is due, and I'll do my best to help you out, all right? Have a great day.